Good morning and welcome uh, to our morning service here in Ebenezer. And uh, if you're visiting, uh, it's good to see some visitors amongst us. If you're visiting, we give you a special welcome and uh, a special welcome also to the, uh, the beach team. It's great to see you back uh, with us for the summer. Uh, we are going to begin by singing a well-known hymn. Uh, the words will appear on the screen, O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hand hath made. I see the stars, I hear the mighty thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Verse 3, and when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in, that on the cross my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin and we'll stand to sing.
let us turn in our Bibles for our first scripture reading this morning, which is taken from the Gospel of John, and chapter 9, the Gospel of John, and chapter 9. And after we have uh, had this reading, you may wish to keep your Bibles open at that page, uh, because our second reading will follow on uh, immediately. Uh, over recent weeks, uh, we've been uh, looking at, thinking about people Jesus met. In John's Gospel, people Jesus met, and uh, we began by thinking of that surprised woman in John chapter 4. Uh, we then had a look at that disabled man that Jesus met in John chapter 5, and uh, today from John chapter 9, we are going to think of the blind man uh, that Jesus met. People Jesus met. John chapter 9, verse 1, let us hear. The word of God. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbours and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes opened, they demanded. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. Where is this man? they asked him. I don't know, he said. <coughs> now, if you're from the locality, you will have received a notice sheet uh, for this week. But uh, if you haven't received one, if you're visiting and would like to know what's on during the course of this week, uh, then there are a couple of uh, paper copies uh, of the notice sheet there for the, from the front, and uh, feel free to take, uh, to take one. Uh, just to say that we're back here at 6 o'clock uh, for our evening service, and then Tuesday, 7.30, we have our prayer meeting, both here in the church and on Zoom, whichever is easiest. And then on Thursday evening, 7.30, there is a church members meeting, uh, both here in the church and on Zoom. And also, I know it's not the last Sunday in July yet. Uh, there is one more, but just in case you're not here next Sunday and you need the Bible reading plan for August, uh, then there are paper copies of it uh, in the porch. And uh, we're delighted uh, to have uh, the beach team with us. Uh, back. It's great to see the red t-shirts uh, back for the beach mission in Bentleck. They're with us uh, for the next uh, four weeks, five weeks, five weeks. And, uh, and so we look forward to enjoying fellowship with you over these next four or five weeks. And uh, just to say that the beach team have kindly agreed uh, to run our Sunday school over these coming weeks. And so any children uh, who wish to uh, go through to the annex uh, during the second hymn, uh, during our second hymn, then uh, there will be a Sunday school there for you run by the beach team. And uh, we need to remember that this is not the only beach team that's taken place. UBM, United Beach Missions, run beach teams uh, throughout the UK and further afield. And uh, we need to remember their work over these summer months. And also we need to remember those who have gone from this church uh, down to Tenby, uh, JP and Fiona and Caleb are down there this week uh, for the uh, beach mission there. 
in Tenby, and so we can remember them in our prayers as well. Let us pray. Our God, we come to you this morning and uh, we come to thank you for what we've been able to express in our opening praise. We thank you that we've been able to say, Then sings my soul, my Saviour God to thee, how great thou art. And we thank you, our God, for the great privilege this morning of coming into the presence of this great God and of coming to you and acknowledging you to be this great God and of bringing to you our praise and our adoration and our thanksgiving this morning. We thank you, our God, for every way in which you have demonstrated your greatness. Forgive us, Father, for not having the eyes to see it on so many occasions, but we thank you for what we have appreciated of your majesty and your glory and your power. We thank you, our God, as we look around ourselves at the world we live in, the universe we are part of, and as we look at ourselves and see how we are wonderfully and fearfully made, we thank you, our God, for that great demonstration that we see of your power and your wisdom. But we thank you, our God, that we've been able to sing not only of what you have done in creation, but we thank you that we've been able to sing about what you have done in redemption. For when I think that God, his son not sparing, sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. And Father, we thank you for that greater work of yours, that work of sending your Son into this world to rescue and redeem poor, wretched, guilty, hell-bound sinners like us. We thank you, our God, not only for that demonstration of your power, but we thank you for that great demonstration of your love and your grace, and that while we were still sinners, you loved us, and you loved us to the extent that you sent your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us. Father, we give you thanks for your greatness, for your glory, for your grace. And we do pray, Father, that as we've met together this morning, and as we sing these hymns, and as we pray, and as we hear your word, and as we fellowship together, we do pray that our time together this morning might bring each one of us into a greater appreciation of who you really are, and of how great a God you really are. And so, Father, we commit ourselves to you. We do pray for those who are not here. Father, we do thank you for watching over us during this past week as a church. We thank you for restoring so many of us to health and strength. But we do pray for those who are still ill, and we commit them to you. And do pray, Father, that they might know your help and your strength and your encouragement this morning. We pray, Father, for those who have left this church to go elsewhere and to spread the gospel. And uh, we do commit JP and Fiona and Caleb and the team down there in Tenby. And we do pray, Father, that you would encourage them during these coming few weeks. And uh, we pray, Father, that you would watch over them, that you would keep them safe. We pray that you would preserve the unity of the team. And, Father, we do pray that you would prepare hearts to hear the good seed of your word. What we pray for Tenby, Father, we do pray for the beaches up and down the length and breadth of our country. Thank you, Father, for the great gospel opportunities uh, that this time of year provides. And Father, we do pray for the team here in Bentley. Thank you for them. Thank you for their desire uh, to spend this week of the summer reaching people with the gospel. And uh, Father, we do ask that you would encourage them and strengthen them this week. Father, we do pray that as children and parents and grandparents hear the good news about our Saviour, Father, we pray for the work of your Spirit, the sovereign and secret work of your Spirit in the hearts and minds of people that bring them to conviction of sin, that open their eyes, as we'll see from John chapter 9, that open their eyes to see their need of Christ and bring them to saving faith in him. And so we do commit the work of the gospel throughout our country to you today. 
We commit ourselves to you. Commit ourselves to you as a nation in all its need. And Father, we do pray for this period of uncertainty in government. We pray that you would watch over us and preserve our freedoms and our stabilities. And Father, we do pray for those who would be uh, aim to be our next Prime Minister. Father, we pray that you would overrule in that process. We thank you for the great assurance that your word gives us that those who are in positions of power are there by divine appointment. And Father, we do pray that you would indeed work out your sovereign purposes even at this time, we pray. And so we commit ourselves to you now. Pray for your help as we turn to your word, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our second scripture reading is taken again from John chapter 9, this time from verse 13 uh, through to the end of the chapter. And uh, Michael Walters is going to come and read those verses to us. <coughs> So it's John chapter 9, starting at verse 13. Let's hear the word of God. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had been blind. Now the day on which Jesus made the mud and opened the man's eyes was a Sabbath. Therefore the Pharisees also asked him how he had received his sight. He put mud on my eyes, the man replied, and I washed and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. But others asked, How can a sinner do such miraculous signs? So they were divided. Finally, they turned again to the blind man. What have you to say about him? It was your eyes he opened. The man replied, He is a prophet. The Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they sent for the man's parents. Is this your son, they asked? Is this the one you say was born blind? How is it that now he can see? We know he is our son, the parents answered, and we know he was born blind. But how he can see now, or who opened his eyes, we don't know. Ask him. He is of age. He will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for already the Jews had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. That was why his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. A second time they summoned the man who had been blind. Give glory to God, they said. We know this man is a sinner. He replied, whether he is a sinner or not, I don't know. One thing I do know, I was blind, but now I see. Then they asked him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered, I have told you already and you do not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you want to cut, become his disciples too? Then they hurled insults at him and said, You are this fellow's disciple. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but as for this fellow, we don't even know where he comes from. The man answered, Now that is remarkable. You don't know where he comes from, yet, yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners. He listens to the godly man who does his will. Nobody has ever heard of opening the eyes of a man born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. To this they replied, you were steeped in sin at birth. How dare you lecture us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out. And when he found him, he said, do you believe in the son of man? Who is he, sir? The man asked. Tell me so that I may believe in him. Jesus said, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one speaking with you. Then the man said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see and those who see will become blind. 
Some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him say this and asked, what are we blind to? Jesus said, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin. But now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Before we return to look at John chapter 9, uh, we are going to sing another well-known hymn, famous hymn of John Newton, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound That Saved a Wretch Like Me. And uh, if you listen to what John Newton says next, uh, he says, I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. That's what's happened in John chapter 9. More ways than one. A man was blind, but then could see. Standing to sing. And uh, if uh, the children want to go to Sunday school, then uh, they can do so during this hymn. Thank you.
<coughs> Let us turn in our Bibles to the Gospel of John and chapter uh, 9. John's Gospel and chapter 9. You turn on the television and you see people suffering from starvation in some famine affected region of the world. You switch on the radio and you hear of people suffering the horrors of war in the Ukraine. You go to the hospital and you see people, young and old, suffering from illnesses of one kind or another. Everywhere you look, it seems that you're confronted with suffering. And so not surprisingly, a question which many people ask at some point is this. Why is there so much suffering in our world? And far from being a new question, it's one that people have been asking for centuries. And it's one that Jesus is confronted with at the very start of John chapter 9. Which brings me to my first point this morning, and that is the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. The power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. As Jesus made his way through Jerusalem, he came across a blind man. This was not someone whose eyesight had gradually deteriorated over time until he could no longer see. Instead, this was someone who had been blind from birth and therefore was someone who had never been able to see. And on seeing this man, the disciples turned to Jesus and asked him, Who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? The assumption is that suffering is always the result of sin. And because he's been blind from birth, the disciples want to know, is this man suffering because of his own sin or because of his parents' sin? And in reply, Jesus says, verse 3, neither this man nor his parents sinned. And those words of Jesus ought to stop us. There's plenty of other passages in the Bible that would stop us as well. But those words of Jesus alone ought to stop us from drawing straight lines between suffering and sin. Yes, there is a general sense in which suffering is the result of sin. You read the opening chapters of the Bible and you won't find the slightest hint of suffering in the original creation. It's only after the rebellion of Adam and Eve towards their creator and it's a result of that rebellion that suffering becomes such an ugly feature of life on this planet. And so there is a general sense in which all suffering in this world is the result of sin. But that is very different from what these disciples were thinking. They thought that a particular case of suffering could always be traced back to a particular sin. <coughs> but that is wrong, says Jesus. It is not because of sin on the part of him or his parents that this man is born blind. Instead, verse 3, <laughs> this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. And as you read on, you see what that work is. It's the work of giving sight to the blind. Verse 6 tells us that having said this, Jesus spat on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. Now later on, it becomes evident that this is not a kid. This is not a teenager. This is a grown up man of working age. And so can you imagine the response of friends and family when he got back home that day? This is a man who spent his entire life 
being dependent on others, both practically and financially. This is a man who spent his entire life begging in order to survive from day to day. This is a man whose entire life has been spent in darkness. And now he walks home seeing. Can you picture it? The neighbours ask, verse 8, hang on a minute. Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some said yes. It is the same man. While others said no, come on. It cannot possibly be. It must just be someone who looks very much like him. But end of verse 9. He himself insisted. I am the man. It's not an optical illusion. You're not imagining it. <laughs> I am that man. During the past couple of weeks, we've heard someone famous, Samo Farah, saying, I'm not who you thought I was. Here we have a man saying the very opposite. Here we have a man saying, I am who you thought I was. And what he is saying is equally shocking because of the enormous change that has taken place in his experience. How did it happen? The neighbours want to know. How could it possibly have happened? And in reply, he says, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash, so I went and washed, and then I could see. <coughs> That is the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. And that is one of the miraculous signs that John has recorded for us in his book. Now, if you were here a few weeks ago, you may remember what I said about these miraculous signs that John records. However much we are delighted for this man in John 9, the really important thing, and you need to get this clear, the really important thing is not the miracle itself, but what it points to. That is the important thing about signs. It's what it points to. And what does this miracle point to? Well, in verse 5, we hear Jesus saying, while I am in the world... I am the light of the world. And that is precisely the claim that Jesus has proved to be true on this occasion. And it's not the first time he made that claim. For example, just flick back a page to chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Don't you agree that that has been the experience of this man at one level? With so much light pollution these days, it's quite difficult to know or experience what true darkness really is. Even if you go out at night, you'll always see some lights in the distance. I remember living in a cottage in the very north of Scotland and when I stood at night on the doorstep and looked round 180 degrees, I couldn't see a single light. But even that was not real pitch darkness. When our boys were little, we took them to the Big Pit National Coal Mining Museum in South Wales. And as part of our guided tour, we got into a lift and we went down 300 feet into the depths of the earth to the coal face where the miners would have been working. Thankfully, we had helmets and headlamps on, but once we got down there, the guide told us to switch our lamps off. And believe me, that was a darkness I had never experienced before or since. And that's what life was like for this poor man at the start of John chapter 9. 
He walked around in darkness every moment of every day. He lived his life in darkness. But as a result of Jesus, the light of the world, meeting him, he no longer walks in darkness, but he now enjoys the light of life, the light that enables him to live life as it was meant to be lived. Having claimed to be the light of the world, that light which can take a person from utter darkness to a life of light. Jesus has demonstrated the truth of that claim by giving this man his sight. That is the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. But please note, Jesus didn't come into this world just to give physical sight to physically blinded people. He came into this world to give spiritual sight to spiritually blinded people. And that is why John chapter 9 doesn't end at verse 12. If all Jesus had come to do was give physical sight to a blind man, the chapter would have finished at verse 12. The account of the actual miracle only takes up a quarter of the chapter. And it's as you read on that you see the true significance of the miracle and what it was pointing to. For example, as you read on, you discover that this same man, he undergoes another profound change in his experience. And what was that? Well, in response to the neighbor's inquiry, verse 11, he says, when asked who did this, he says, that man they call Jesus. That's all he can say about the man who had given him his sight at this point in the story. That man they called Jesus. He's got nothing more to say about him. But that is not the last time he speaks. Because the miracle took place on the Sabbath, this man is further interrogated by the religious authorities in Jerusalem. They say concerning Jesus, verse 16, this man is not from God, for he does not keep the Sabbath. Others pres- present have a very different opinion on Jesus, and they say, verse 16, how can a sinner do such miraculous signs? And whether it was here and on that discussion, listening in on this discussion, that this man began to think, we do not know. But by the time he's asked again about Jesus he has something more to say about him did you notice that their question to him in verse 17 now is what have you to say about him it was your eyes that he opened and in reply he says this time he is a prophet He is a prophet. Jesus is no longer just an ordinary man as far as he is concerned. He is a special man. A prophet. And by the time you get to the closing verses of the chapter, you discover that this man's opinion of Jesus is getting even bigger. And it's getting even clearer. Having been summoned a second time by the religious leaders, this man is thrown out of the synagogue in verse 34. On finding him, Jesus said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? The Son of Man, anybody from a Jewish background would have been familiar with that phrase. It was a divine messianic title from the Old Testament that Jesus frequently used for himself. And in response to the question, do you believe in the Son of Man? This man says, who is he, sir? Tell me so that I may believe in him. To which Jesus replies, you have now seen him. In fact, he is the one that's speaking to you. And on hearing that, this man says, verse 38, Lord, (laughs) I believe. (laughs) I believe in the Son of Man. I believe that you are the Son of Man. And he worshipped him. He worshipped him. Do you see the change that has taken place in the experience of this man? In addition to receiving his physical sight in this chapter, this man has also received his spiritual sight during the course of this chapter. Having started this chapter blind to who Jesus is, 
by the end of the chapter, he now sees clearly who he is and he responds accordingly in faith and in worship. Having started the chapter in spiritual darkness, by the end of the chapter, he's enjoying the light of life in its fullest sense. He's enjoying spiritual life, eternal life, life as it was meant to be lived, a life of worship through faith in Jesus. That is the great transformation that has taken place in the experience of this man as a result of his encounter with Jesus Christ. That is the power of Jesus to give sight, spiritual sight, to the spiritually blind. And the big question this morning is whether you and I have known that sight-given power of Jesus in our experience. The physical blindness which this man suffered at birth is thankfully very rare today. Statistics for the United States reveal that such a condition affects two or possibly three children in a hundred thousand births. Very rare. Which means that the vast majority of people know what it is to grow up seeing. And I'm sure you will agree this morning what a great privilege that is. We grow up enjoying the sights of a very colourful world. You take it for granted, but you grow up in joy in all the colours around you, from the blue sky to the green grass to the red roses. We grow up enjoying the beautiful sights of a created world, its mountains, its plants, its wildlife and its sunsets. Those are the privileges of being able to see as we grow up. And we ought to be extremely thankful for the privilege. But although physical blindness is extremely rare at birth, did you know the Bible teaches that spiritual blindness is universal at birth? Did you realise that? Spiritual blindness is universal at birth. In other words, we enter this world unable to see as we ought to. Unable to see who God is and unable to appreciate what he has done. That is why, although we live in a world that has continually shown us the beauty and the glory and the power and the wisdom of the God who created it, we so often fail to see it for what it is. And consequently, we fail to give him the worship that he's worthy of. And as a result of failing to see God as he really is, <laughs> the next problem is that we fail to see ourselves as we really are. And you think, no, come on, I looked in the mirror this morning. I can see who I am. I know what I'm like. Do you? It was Robert Burns, the 18th century Scottish poet, who said in a poem called To a Loose on seeing one on a lady's bonnet in church, he said this, Oh, with some power the gift of gee is to see ourselves as others see us. It would fray money a blunder free us and foolish notion. In other words, says Burns, for those of you who didn't quite follow, oh, that someone would enable us to see ourselves as others see us. For that ability would prevent us from making many mistakes in life. And that ability would prevent us from having a wrong estimation of ourselves. And if seeing ourselves as others see us would have such a dramatic effect upon us, how much greater would be the effect if we could see ourselves as God sees us. It is, after all, <laughs> it is his estimation of us that really counts at the end of the day, is it not? 
And yet, because we don't see him as he really is in all his moral and sinless perfection, we fail to see ourselves as we really are. We fail to appreciate just how far short we fall of what our creator expects of us and demands of us. And having failed to see God as he really is, and having failed to see ourselves as we really are, our spiritual blindness prevents us from seeing the person and work of Jesus Christ for what it really is. Like the man at the start of John chapter 9, we don't understand who Jesus really is. Often seeing him as nothing more than a good man, an influential teacher, a moral example. And because we don't see our sinfulness as it really is, we cannot see the true purpose for which he came into this world and died on a cross. Such are the consequences of being spiritually blind. But the great news of John chapter 9 <laughs> is that Jesus is the light of the world, verse 5. And as Jesus himself said in verse 39, I have come into this world so that the blind will see. In the person of Jesus Christ, there is someone who can deal with our spiritual blindness. There is someone who can open our eyes to see God for who he really is. There is someone who can open our eyes to see ourselves as we really are. There is someone who can open our eyes and enable us to see who Jesus is and why he came into this world. And why as a sinless, perfect man, he went to a cross and died. In the person of Jesus Christ, who there is someone who can open our eyes, perform that greatest of all miracles, even greater than the one that we read about at the start of John chapter 9. In the person of Jesus Christ, there is someone who can open our eyes, our spiritual eyes, to see and understand and appreciate those great truths. That is the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. And if you turn to him and trust him this morning, he will do that great transform and sight given work for you. Then you'll be able to sing. Oh, yes, you sang it. It sounded wonderful. But then you'll be able to sing with meaning. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I am found was blind but now I see that is the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind secondly we also see in this chapter the judgment of Jesus to confirm the blindness of the blind. The judgment of Jesus to confirm the blindness of the blind. Now, if you look carefully at verse 39, you will see that Jesus didn't only say that the blind would see as a result of his coming into this world. Yes, he did say that. That was a part of what he said. But he said that within the context of a broader statement concerning his coming. And here it is, verse 39. For judgment, I have come into this world. Is that one of the verses in the Bible that you're more familiar with about why Jesus came into this world? I suspect not. But here is Jesus himself speaking. For judgment I have come into this world so that the blind will see. <laughs> And we've seen that in John chapter 9. And many of us have known that in our experience. So that the blind will see. But Jesus went on to say this. And so that those who see. Will become blind. Hmm. That's an interesting one. Isn't it? Jesus said that not only in the presence of the man who was blind, but who could now see. 
He also said it in the presence of the religious leaders, i.e. the Pharisees. And on hearing those words, they pipe up and they say, verse 40, what? Are we blind too? And then reply, Jesus said this, verse 41, if you were blind, you would not be guilty of sin, but now that you claim you can see, your guilt remains. You see, the difference between the man and the Pharisees was that he, the man, he was blind and he knew it. Whereas they are blind and don't know it. They think they can see. They think they can see the truth, whereas in actual fact, they are blind to the truth. And so what Jesus is saying to him was, listen, if you were aware of your true condition, if you were aware of your spiritual blindness and eager to be cured of it, you would not be guilty of sin, i.e. the sin of rejecting me. But because you think, because you assume you can see, you have neglected me, you've rejected me, and consequently your guilt remains. In rejecting Jesus, their blindness concerning him has not only continued, it has not only persisted, it has actually intensified. Is that not what we see happening during the course of the chapter? As we've worked our way through this chapter, we've seen two processes taking place. We've seen the spiritually blind man gain his sight and become clear in his understanding of Jesus. But at the same time, we've seen religious people who assumed they could see. We've seen those people become increasingly blind in their understanding of Jesus. For example, on hearing about the miracle initially from the man himself, the Pharisees dismissed it. Dismissed its significance. That is why we read in verse 18, the Jews still did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight. And so although this miracle has occurred, as we are told in verse 3, so that the work of God might be displayed, these Pharisees are blind to the work which God is doing before their very eyes. But then having interviewed the man's parents... They cannot deny that this man was blind, but now sees. But what they are determined to deny, however, is that the miracle demonstrates that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah sent from God. Verse 22 tells us that already the Jews had decided, they have made up their mind, they had decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Christ would be put out of the synagogue. Do you see what is happening in the experience of these religious leaders they have the living evidence of one of Jesus' miracles standing before their very eyes, and yet they cannot see the truth which that miracle demonstrates. Which shows, does it not, not, not just how blind these religious leaders were, it demonstrates that their blindness is only getting worse. So much so that we hear them say concerning Jesus in verse 24, give glory to God. We know this man is a sinner. <laughs> what a strange conclusion to draw about Jesus from the miracle. <laughs> they know this man is a sinner. It was a response that demonstrates their determined and their persistent refusal to see or acknowledge who Jesus is. And their encounter with Jesus has only made that determination greater. That is the judgment that Jesus was referring to in verse 39. The judgment of being confirmed in their blindness. What we see in this chapter is that being the light of the world, people's encounter with Jesus back then had one of two effects. It either removed their spiritual blindness or it made it worse. And 2,000 years later, our encounter with the truth concerning Jesus still has one of those two effects. Did you realize that? 
During this past week, we have been vividly reminded of the effects of the sun, both positively and negatively. The rays from the sun were so strong on Tuesday that it not only brought much needed warmth to our bodies and our gardens, it also brought sunburn and dehydration and destruction to parts of our country. And now that we've returned to more normal weather, the rays from the sun, they still have positive and negative effects. Positively, it provides us with the light that is necessary to find our way around during the day. That's how much we need the sun, so that we can see our way around during the day. But you look at the sun directly, and that same light will damage your eyes forever. Our encounter with the light from the sun can either give us sight so that we can see, or it can blind us. And likewise, being the light of the world, our encounter with Jesus Christ can either bring us sight, or it can blind us. For judgment I have come into this world, so that the blind will see, and those who see will become blind. And so that being the case, in the light of those solemn words that Jesus speaks at the very end of this chapter, in the light of those words, let us not be like those Pharisees who thought they were fine, who thought they could see, and consequently rejected Jesus, and in doing so were confirmed in their spiritual blindness. Rather than be like them, let us make sure that we're like the other man in John chapter 9, who recognised his need of Jesus, who recognised his need of having his eyes open to see the truth concerning Jesus, and as a result came to believe in him and worshipped him. Let us make sure that our response to the light of the world this morning is like his and not like theirs. Better to respond to the light of the world in that humble and believing way and end up seeing rather than reject the light of the world and remain blind. Oh yes, that is possible. Because as we've seen this morning, John chapter 9 shows us two things. Firstly, we have seen the power of Jesus to give sight to the blind. Not only physical sight to the physically blind, we've seen that in the experience of that man. But we've also seen him give spiritual sight to the spiritually blind. We've seen that in the experience of that man as well. But at the same time, we have seen the frightening scenario. We've seen the judgment of Jesus to confirm the blindness of the blind. As one person has said, there's nothing more dangerous than someone who's blind but doesn't know it. That was what those Pharisees were. They were blind, didn't know it, consequently saw no need of Jesus, rejected him, and in doing so, were simply confirmed in their blindness. Let us make sure that that is not our response to Jesus this morning. Let us make sure that our response to the light of the world is one of humble repentance and faith so that we come to see as we ought to. We are going to sing uh, the hymn on the screen. And uh, it's a hymn that would be a fitting testimony for that man in John chapter 9. And I trust a fitting testimony for many of us here this morning. Lord, I was blind. I could not see. In your mad visage any grace, 
but now the beauty of your face in radiant vision dawns on me. Verse 4 reads, Lord, I was dead, I could not move. My lifeless soul from sin's dark grave, but now the power of life you gave has raised me up to know your love. Stand and to sing. Father, we do give you thanks for the power and the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ demonstrated in that chapter. We thank you that in the miracle he demonstrated that he really is the light of the world. We thank you, our God, that he's able to give light, to give sight, not only to physically blinded people like that man in John 9, but we thank you, our God, that he's able to give spiritual sight to spiritually blinded people like us. And Father, we do pray that by your grace and through the work of your Spirit, we pray that that might indeed be the experience of each one of us come to him in repentance and faith, so that we might indeed be moved from darkness 